Thank you for joining Jennifer Shelton Associates in our 2019 Webinar Wednesday series. We are coming to you live from downtown Washington, D.C. Our webinars are every Wednesday, and you can find the upcoming schedule on our website. Past webinars and all recordings are also on our website and on our YouTube channel, along with over 160 other recordings on federal contracting topics. All are complimentary. If you have questions for our speaker today, you can email her directly with the contact information you'll see on the last slide. Just a little bit about us. We are a Washington, D.C.-based firm and provide services for federal contractors. This ranges from market analysis reports to proposal writing and also post-award compliance. More information is on our website, so please visit us. And these are a couple of upcoming events that you can find more information here or also on our website. We now offer advertising, so you can email me if you would like more information. And our webinar today is sponsored by AccuTrack, and here's a short message from them. AccuTrack Consulting and Accounting Services is an 8A WOSB CPA firm committed to supporting entities to sustain growth in government contracting. Our outstanding DCAA accounting solutions reduce audit risk, improve cash flows, and give you peace of mind. Contact us today to learn how we can enhance your DCAA accounting efforts. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Our speaker today is Margaret Cassidy and she's gonna be covering facility clearances and working with different security services. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Margaret. I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you, Mallory. Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to be talking, as Mallory said, about obtaining your, your facility clearance, what that process entails. And it's, I'm also going to cover, if you already have a clearance, some things that you need to keep in mind and make sure that you are doing. And in the process of this discussion, how you can effectively work with the Defense Security Services and what types of things are they looking for from you to either give you a security clearance for your entity or alternatively so that you can maintain your security clearance. Mallory, if you can go to the next slide. So in completing a facility clearance, before, before we begin discussing it in a little bit more detail, please remember that a facility clearance is similar to the personal clearance that people get. If you are an individual and you're going to be dealing with um, classified or other information of the United States government, the government will do a background check and ultimately if you pass that background check, they'll give you a security clearance in order to handle sensitive and classified information of the United States government. The same concept applies to an entity or to a facility or to a business. That is, the government knows that it needs contractors to be able to execute a lot of its government contracts to include classified contracts. Therefore, if you are interested in getting a classified contract, then you need to become a cleared facility just as you would go about becoming a cleared person. A cleared facility, one of the things that's required to get a clearance is you have to first be sponsored either by a federal government contracting agency that wants you to have and perform a classified contract or alternatively by a prime contractor that wants you to work with them on a classified contract. Once you get that sponsorship, then you start the facility clearance application process. It begins with an online questionnaire that you need to provide and complete for the United, to the United States government. It is done so that the Defense Security Service can evaluate you as a business and your risk to performing classified contracts. The material that the online application requests is being requested so that the government can make an assessment of whether or not you're going to be responsible in holding and managing classified materials, but also responsible in being able to perform a classified contract. When you're providing information to the government through this security clearance application process, or anytime you're providing information to the government, the information needs to be accurate, truthful, and complete. So it's important to remember that as you fill out and provide this information to the government, failing to do enough due diligence, failing to look in all corners of your business about what you actually have going on, and you'll see as we go through this deck, what it is that you're going to have to tell the government. Failing to do that exposes you to a situation where the government thinks that you were not providing accurate, truthful, or complete information, 
even if you didn't mean to do it. What this means is you need to have a, a solid due diligence process so that when you give this information to the United States government, you as an entity are confident that, what you, that you have gathered all the information and it's the complete information. Going through the security clearance process requires a phone interview, requires a site visit, and then completing this online registration where you're going to provide a number of documents and a bunch of information about your company to the government. The phone interview and the site visit are done to talk with people in your organization, your leaders, your executive, your federal security officer, to make sure that they understand the rules and the regulations and the laws that are required of an organization that is going to be a cleared facility. Not only do you have to understand those, but then you have to be able to put them in place and show to the Defense Security Service folks that you, in fact, are able to manage classified materials and to execute a classified contract. Through this process, although DSS is technically a regulator and making sure that you do it correctly, they view themselves as a collaborative partner working with the clear community, working with contractors in industry who hold a clearance and who are having access to classified materials. So it is, they are a useful source of information, a useful source of guidance, and their site contains tons of information for contractors seeking clearance or who already have a clearance. So if we go on to the next slide, One of the things that you'll hear as you go through a process of becoming cleared or if you're already cleared is this issue of foreign ownership control and interest, FOCI. What the, this is one of the things that the government is evaluating your business for if you're seeking a classified, um, if you're seeking to be a classified um, contractor. What it is, is is looking to see if you as an organization have any foreign ownership, control, or interest. What this means is is there any non-U.S. person or non-U.S. entity that has the power to control your company's operations or to otherwise do something that will give them access to classified information or that will give them access and the ability to adversely affect the performance of a classified contract? It's important to remember that this law is very expansive and it's not just based on what percentage of your business a non-U.S. person may own, but rather, do they have some way to exert control? Do they have some sort of interest such that they can impact how you perform as a business? And the impact or their control can either be direct or it could be indirect. It's a very discrete factual analysis depending on how you as an organization are structured, who owns your organization, who controls your organization, who has decision-making authority in your organization. And as we go through the next slide, you're going to see all the types of things that the United States government asks of you as a business to determine whether or not you have foreign ownership, control, and interest. The other thing, remember, that the government is looking at as they go through this analysis, however, is making sure that even if you have zero foreign control, ownership, and interest, do you have physical security, IT security, an educated workforce, educated and committed leaders all arranged such that you will be a good steward and a good protector of classified information. If you're able, if you're not able to exhibit that to the government or if they feel that you can't do that, regardless of whether you have foreign ownership or control, you still may not get, um, get the award of being a classified contractor. So as, as a starting basis, when you are filling out your application online, some of the information that the DSS is going to require you to reveal is the structure of your business, your cage codes, your EIN, the address of your business, the address of your different offices. They want to know which DSS office is going to be the one that's going to take care of you. The DSS, although based in Quantico, has field offices across the U.S. and depending on where you're located, you'll have a local DSS office. So when you complete this application, they're going to want to know which field office is going to have responsible for, responsibility for your organization. You'll need to reveal in your um, information through this process every entity or person which directly or indirectly owns 5% or more of your business. You're going to need to list your key management personnel, your, key, your directors, your officers, your shareholders, 
you're also going to need to indicate whether they are a U.S. person or not. You'll also have to complete a certificate pertaining to foreign ownership. And if you do have any foreign ownership, you're going to be required to provide the details of that ownership. You will be required to identify and list any relationships that your company, your entity has with foreign entities, foreign persons. It also is going to require you to list any relationships that your key management personnel, your directors, your officers, shareholders, and other high-ranking people have with non-U.S. persons or non-U.S. entities. That will have to be identified in its close as well. You'll also have to identify any foreign offices that you may have. Even if it's not permanent space, you will still need to, to disclose that, and you'll have to explain the nature of that office that you have that's not on U.S. soil. If we can go on to the next slide. So all of these disclosures are going to require certain contracts, and, or excuse me, certain documents be produced and be provided. And if, if, you're, if you're wanting to become a cleared contractor, you should start thinking about gathering this information and making sure you have it and it's up to date before you even begin this process. So some of the documents that are required. This is only an example list because it could be far more than this, depending on what your situation is and depending on how you operate as a business but they will expect to see an organizational chart. How are you set up as an organization? Subsidiaries, affiliates, etc., should be captured in your organizational chart. They are also going to expect to see a personnel organization chart. Who are the leaders of your organization? What is their reporting structure? Who controls what, etc., in an org chart of your personnel? They will also expect to have your bylaws your state certificate of good standing. So whatever state you're registered in to do business, they're going to want to see that you're in good standing in that state. You're going to want to produce the board meetings discussing that you want to become a cleared facility and how you will manage that, who in leadership will obtain a clearance, and who in leadership will have the knowledge and experience to execute and oversee that clearance process and maintaining the requirements necessary as a cleared contractor. The regulations acknowledge that if you have a board of directors of 15 people or even of five people or you have an executive team of seven people, however you are organized, the government acknowledges that you don't always need all of your directors, all of your owners, all of your executives to hold their own personal security clearance. However, if you're going to have leaders, and again, this will be unique to your organization, if you're going to have certain persons It looks like there's been a technical difficulty, so we'll have this re-recorded and posted on YouTube within about 48 hours. Thank you, everybody.